This is the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition Dungeon Master's Guide. In this book, among the rules and advice for game masters, both helpful and questionable, are a variety of appendices. These have everything from random tables for creating your own dungeons and world maps to pages of reference tables. Among these is Appendix N a list of recommended works of fiction that can spur your inspiration as a dungeon master and as a player. Included because heroic fantasy and swords and sorcery were not as well known then as it was today. Other RPG books since then, including other editions of D&D, have continued the tradition of providing recommended works of fiction to spur players and game masters, later going on to include television series, comics, and films as well. However, generally, these sections omit works of anime. It's time to rectify that. This is the Anime Appendix N. Alright, welcome at last to the first proper installment of the Anime Appendix N. I'm starting off by going into the genre that probably best applies to Dungeons and Dragons, the game from which I took the title of the show, specifically the genre of fantasy. One of the running jokes that people make when it comes to fantasy and role-playing games is that whenever the GM conceives of the campaign, they come to the table attending for their game to be something like the anime Record of Lotus War. This is a joke that people even make if they don't watch anime at all. However, the campaign ends up certain turning out like Slayers instead, and honestly, I think that's a pretty unfair assessment, and one that I think unnecessarily throws shade on Slayers. The thing is, most role-playing game campaigns I've been in, whether fantasy like D&D or horror like Call of Cthulhu, the unifying factor between them, no matter what the rules are or anything else like that, is that a degree of humor is always brought to the table by the people who play it. For all the warnings that need to be made about um, drawing too much conclusions and comparing your game too much to Critical Role, the fact of the matter is, most episodes of Critical Role and lots of other role-playing games as, um, as actual play campaigns as well, you see the players being able to shift between joking around and being very serious all within the same episode, and that happens a lot at the role-playing game table as well. To use an example from Critical Role, there's an episode of the Vox Machina campaign that starts off with the party members legitimately being scared about a fight with a great dragon that they are not being prepared for, and which concludes with the very serious dramatic moment of the destruction of Draconia and a funeral for a previous player character in the party, whose player has left, and which also has in-character jokes being made about the name of the character of a Seeker Awesome. The thing is, if you watch any season of Slayers, you see a series that also strikes the same balance between very serious dramatic moments and legitimate comedy, and being able to move between them without ruining the experience. By contrast, Lodos has very few moments of comedy. There are certainly moments where you can stop and breathe, like at the ball, and they occasionally have moments of light comedy, like when Parn's hero worship of Cashew causes him to unintentionally snub Deedlet, but no moments of levity that complement the moments of intensity in quite the same way. To put it in perspective of an out example outside of anime, the climax of your campaign should have room to have both this... As far as I'm concerned, that's America's ass. And this. And I am Iron Man. So, I have what I consider to be my spectrum of emotional intensity. My baseline, right in the middle, is Slayers which strikes a pretty good balance of comedy with dramatic tension. Maybe it leans a little more towards the comedic side than the dramatic side, but generally it has it in equal measure. When things get serious, they get very serious, um, but not grimdark or anything like that. But when they get silly, they get pretty darn silly, 
though not to the point where they throw the established setting out the window. If you land here, odds are good that you and your group, almost no matter what your makeup, is going to have a good time in terms of level, in terms of balance of comedy and seriousness. If you are an inexperienced GM, this is what you need to aim for, This or should aim for. If you can land here consistently, then you've gotten a handle on the skills you need to read your group. Now, as you swing to the left or right, we'll start getting into the territory of games that are more emotionally intense or overtly comedic, respectively, which also means that you need to have a better ability to read your group. Additionally, when moving in either direction, I'd say that as a GM, you need to make sure to use player comfort, for lack of a better term, tools like X cards, lines, and veils. It's generally good to use those anyway, as a, no matter what genre you're doing, just to make sure that everyone is having a good time. That's why we're here. But when you're heading into the direction of things that are either more overtly comedic or more heavily dramatic and emotionally intense, it is much better to know where those lines and veils are up front and have players who are comfortable using X cards if things start going in places that they don't want to go in order to make sure, in order to well, make sure that everyone is having a good time. This, again, counts for comedy as well because humor is individual and what works for one player may be crossing the line for another. And it's important for people to be comfortable enough to say, that's not okay. That's crossing a line. Let's not go there. Moving one space to the left is where I'd put Lodos. It's not weighty, and the stakes can often be the same as in Slayers, but it never does much to lighten up the tone. Additionally, Carla, the ultimate antagonist, to a degree, introduces plot beats related to mind control, and having character control taken away from a player character both beat plus both series having characters who are kidnapped by the antagonist for like both the OVA and the mini series um uh, television series having characters who are kidnapped by the antagonist to use as human sacrifices all these are heavier things that i'd say would call for more significant communication with the players for example if you have a player who needs to take a hiatus for a while for a variety of reasons if you're considering having the bad guys capture that player character so the rest of the party can chase them down and rescue them, or to have them be mind whammied by the antagonist so that they can break out of it when, when they return, it's important to make sure that the player is okay with it. And if the player character is being mind controlled, make sure that you know what they're comfortable with their character having done and keep them informed. I don't mean this in the sense of things that the character be comfortable with, but things that you that the player is comfortable with. There is an opportunity for a good role play for character for the character not being okay with the things they did and wanting to go and atone for them while they were under mind control. See also stuff like with Jean Luc Picard and Star Trek: The Next Generation and that sort of thing. But if the player character if the player has a hard line over. When my character's mind rammed, I don't uh, having them had done th done X, Y, or Z is crossing a line for me. But doing things L, M, N, perfectly fine. Then that gives you as a GM some guidance for things that you can do to have with have that character do during the hiatus that will create narrative opportunity for everyone else including the player, when they come back, and doesn't make the player feel like the character is ruined for them. To the farthest left is Kentaro Miura's Berserk. Now, when I initially wrote this episode, it was before Kentaro Miura passed away. But I always had Berserk in mind when talking about the anime Appendix N. Uh, but also, I do need to mention, Berserk is a series that, while I find it to be very well written, and numerous of its presentations in anime have been very well executed, both in terms of the 1997 series and the Studio 3 Celsius, um, I think it was 3 Celsius, anyway, the movie trilogy, anime movie trilogy, which as of this recording is currently available on Netflix. 
it is a series, and I say this with all seriousness, with any attempt to be flippant, hits most of the major triggers that people have out there. Whether it's for sexual assault, child death, no matter what gender, um, including sexual assault on minors, spiders, body horror, mutilation, etc. Um, all these are things that cause problems for people for le their legitimate reasons. So if you're reading this manga or even watching the anime, this is the thing to go in do with that in mind. That said, if you go in for this, you've got a hell of a ride in store. The Golden Age arc of the series has some tremendously written political machinations, with Griffith, Guts, and the Band of the Hawk, through their success in the battlefield, getting thrust into the political machinations of a royal court, someplace where their skill in combat does not necessarily help them. It's something very much along the lines of Game of Thrones, which actually predates the publication of Game of Thrones by about six, seven years. This isn't to say that George R. R. Martin didn't know about it, um, or I said that he knew about it. I... This is not to say that George R. R. Martin knew about it. The manga didn't come out in English until after the first novel came out. That said, if you're planning on putting your focus on court politics, the Golden Age arc is absolutely worth reading. Now, from the Eclipse onwards, we get into some really solid dark fantasy. Now, dark fantasy novels these days are not rare in the slightest. Arguably, they're easier to find now than your more standard heroic fantasy series from the 1990s were, like your Crondors uh, and your Wheel of Times and that sort of thing. But what makes this sec section worth picking up if you're doing a more dark fantasy campaign is the art. Mira's monster designs are, yes, he's passed, but I still stands up, some of the best that have ever been done. So if you're looking for something that'll creep the crap out of your players, or to really get a solid visual sense of a dark fantasy setting, Berserk is a really solid category to work with. Or, Berserk is a really solid series to work with, and really nails the just whole vibe of dark fantasy. Moving to the more comedic side of the list, next to the right is where I put Combatants Will Be Dispatched, a series that, as of this recording, is currently airing. Like another work from the same cr creator, Konosuba, which I'm going to reiterate this a couple times, I'm going to be talking about later, this is an isekai series. One, in this case, one which has a premise where the protagonist is whisked into the fantasy world from a modern setting, not because they died and were reincarnated, but because the villainous organization they worked for sent them there to find new worlds to conquer, only for our protagonist, Agent Six, to be less evil and more kind of just an asshole in the it's always sunny in Philadelphia sense. As a consequence, he tends to prefer the kind of tactics that player characters usually go with, and or at least would go with if they had access to his cheat. The ability to get modern weapons, which they know how to use, with some moderate limitations. So, for example, why fight your way up a tower if you can have the gear to go scale up the outside? That sort of thing. Combatants Will Be Dispatched ha does have a general narrative arc related to invasion of the Demon Lord and all that sort of thing, along with some general political stuff. And that's what makes it different from the series furthest to the right which I'm just going to say now, is Konosuba. And that conflict remains at the fore of the series. There is always this particular dramatic tension that is driving the story forward in particular dimensions. Our heroes, like a lot of groups of player characters, are assholes with not a lot of fucks to give. Pardon my language. But they're the assholes that can do the job that's needed, so their patron or patrons have some tolerance for their action within reason. And when they lose tolerance with their action, they get punishment or get sent on suicide missions or that sort of thing. And finally, we have Konosuba, where the rules are made up and the points don't matter. All the way to the far right. The rules of this setting exist more or less strictly for the sake of advancing comedy. There's a demon, sword, demon lord, but like they aren't an imminent pressing threat necessarily that they are like the way they are 
or can potentially be in Combatants Will Be Dispatched. Um, we you have bit with vegetable monsters which are killed for the sake of the harvest, and you have the town of Chunibio people who were created who their culture was more or less set up by a previous person who was summoned to the world by our useless goddess protect um co party member. That sort of thing. Like if there was a sense that our protagonists in for lack of a better term, in Konosuba, were going to cause the world to end by their inaction um, with all their fucking around, then that would undermine the comedy. Um, it is more or less dependent on a lack of urgency for the various pressing issues, in, or what would otherwise be pressing issues of imminent threats and of world destruction, all this, that, and the other thing. There are a few other fantasy anime series that I want to cover, which each also bring their own separate things to the table that the GMs can learn from when it comes to crafting a fantasy setting or crafting their campaign, even with an existing setting, um, which will be saved for next time because I've already covered five series this month already, so I'll stretch my fantasy coverage over into next month. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.